Today we're going to consider R's library dplyr. I like to think of this library as a package that turns code into sentences. You got to cut me a little bit of slack on this one. I'm going to make an analogy and hope it holds. We'll see what you all think by the end of this. There's two main pieces to R's library dplyr. The first is a set of functions think of them as verbs if you're willing to keep this analogy going that act on and return data frames. That is each function in this library takes as its first argument a data frame and the return type from this uh, function is a data frame. There's a number of functions in this library. The one we'll focus on are arrange for sorting data frames by particular variables. We'll look at filter for extracting or excluding uh, certain observations of the data frame that might be of interest. We'll look at group by, which we'll explain in a little bit, and summarize, which allows us to calculate uh, means or standard deviations or medians or other statistics on numeric columns in the data frame. The other basic piece of this library is a threading macro. Well, at least if you come from the world of list, Lisp, they call it a macro, but here it's a threading function that enables code, oops, just a typo there, enables code to be read from left to right and top to bottom. As is common in English. Here's a quick abstract version of what I mean by this. If you had a function f that takes a data frame as its first argument and then maybe y as a second argument and then you know it could take whatever other arguments it wants and this function returns a data frame then the threading macro is going to allow us to start with the data frame as the noun. That's the threading macro right there. It goes percent greater than percent. And then call or pass that data frame to the function f with the arguments specified later. So in this sense, we can take the data frame, the noun, and then act on it with the verb f and whether, whatever other arguments the function f needs. And this is essentially equivalent to the following. f gets called on the data frame, df, and then the argument y, specified second, and then whatever other arguments you want. The benefit of this is not obvious in its abstract form, like you see here, but I think if we just create an example with a fake data frame, you will start to see why this is super helpful. So let's go move over to our studio and clean up whatever garbage I had here earlier. We don't really need any of that for this example. So I'm trying to type quietly because I've learned that typing shows up very loud in these recordings. Let's create a data frame with two numeric columns, x and y and one new column that we're going to name f that I haven't really told you all about yet. And it's going to consist of categorical variables. That new column f is showing up as strings of the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 which R calls factors. Factors are going to play an important role in the library dplyr. These are variables that you should not or cannot do math on. 
factors is basically what the rest of the world calls a categorical variable, but R happens to call them factors for who knows why. So if you look at the structure of this data frame we just created, it tells us we have a data frame that consists of 20 observations, three variables, X and Y are both integers, and F is a factor that consists of the strings 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So another way we could see this is probably more common to you if we just print out the first six rows of the data frame. However, it's not obvious in this case that the type of the variable f is not numbers because it prints them, the values of f, just as if they were numbers. So let's clear this and then see how the library dplyr can act on this data frame. If you load the library dplyr and happen to get some red warning messages, you can happily ignore them. That's just another one of those issues in R where we should give it a big thumbs down and boo it, that warning messages show up in red occasionally when you load specific libraries. So let's just jump right into it and extract the column x from the data frame and calculate the mean on it. Okay, that's really fairly boring, but let's show you how this threading macro might work with the dplyr function summarize. The dplyr function summarize takes a data frame as its first argument. If you look back to our threading function, this percent greater than percent, what it's going to do is take the argument on the left-hand side of the operator and pass it into the first position of the function summarize. Summarize then takes named functions to operate on the columns of the original data frame df. And notice you don't have to specify the data frame inside the function mean, because the function summarize already has the data frame. You can just happily reference the variable x that lives in the data frame df that summarize accepts as its first argument. You can see we get the exact same calculation from this as we did from just calling mean on the column x extracted from the data frame. So it looks like this is just a lot of extra boilerplate to calculate the same thing, but I think if we start exploring these other functions like filter, where maybe we want to look at only the rows of f where it's equal to 2, you can see we get out a whole new data frame with only the columns, uh, whoops, only the rows of the data frame that are equal to 2. And similarly, you could extract the rows of the entire data frame where f is equal to 4. Or, and you can specify any logical operation in here that you want to extract specific rows of the data frame you might be interested in. Now, the real benefit comes when you start chaining together these operations. So let's try to put new verbs on new lines. So here we will have one chunk of code that I argue will read like a sentence. It starts with the noun and it applies various verbs to the data frame df. It reads as start with the data frame. Filter the column of f to keep only the rows in the data frame where f is equal to 2, 4, or 5 as you saw in our last example below. Then continue to group that data frame by the values in the factor f 
and within each of those groups, here you'll see what group by does, we will calculate the mean of x. If we run it, down below you see that we have filtered to keep only the rows of the data frame equal to 2, 4, or 5. We've grouped by the values in f, and then calculated the mean within each group of f. So here, for all the values of x where f is equal to 2, we have calculated the mean at 4.5. The next row down is all the values of x for which the rows were equal, for which f was equal to 4 is 8.5. And all the values of x where f was equal to 5 average to 10.5. This is the power of dplyr, especially when you consider what this chunk of code would look like without the function filter. As an exercise, try to recreate the above code without dplyr. That one might take you a while, and I'd only suggest spending 20 minutes on it and then moving on. And if you can't get it within 20 minutes, I think you should accept the power of dplyr. From here, let's see if we can find a more interesting example where we stop looking at my iTunes account and we will find, let's see, I have gone to my GitHub repository named data. I'm going to scroll down here and look at this bike data set. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this bike sharing data set. It is a data set about bike sharing and the numbers of people who have rented bikes correlated with environmental or seasonal variables. So this is some bike sharing company that is interested in the count of total rental bikes and they want to know what environmental variables are going to increase the number of rented bikes that they see. Things like temperature. They have done some weird stuff to the variable, but higher means hotter and lower means cooler. And they want to know, do people rent more bikes when it's hotter out or when it's cold out? Or probably more likely, something right in between. Do people rent more bikes um, on working days, maybe they're commuting, or on not working days, maybe they're just going out for exercise. Mm, for what season might they rent more bikes? Um, let's see, they have year and month and various other things that you can explore on your own. What you should take away from this is some of these variables, like season, should be thought of as factors in the words of R's types. You cannot add spring and summer together and get a new season out. Because you cannot math these variables' values, we should think of this as a new type. We will call it factor. So we could group by season and then average the count of total rented bikes per season. That would be an excellent task for the library dplyr. So let's see, this data set is, needs some help. It does not have the CSV easily attached, so I will go get the raw link to the CSV, copy the URL, go back into our studio and create a new data frame based on this bikes data set. And we can very easily start with the data frame of interest, group by season, and then summarize by calculating the mean going to change the name of that column in the returned data frame so you see as a more thorough example how you get to choose the name of that column and then calculate the mean of the total number of rented bikes 
within each season. So let's see if we go back the seasons correspond to let's see one is spring fine two is summer three is fall and four is winter so we can see spring summer fall and winter just based on the means alone spring surprisingly seems to have the least number of rented bikes summer seems to have the second highest average number of rented bikes. Fall apparently is the most popular for renting bikes, and winter is somewhere in third, it looks. What's nice about this library dplyr is that you can read. Take this data frame, group it by season, and then summarize it by calculating the mean of the count of rented bikes. And in fact, you can do any number of calculations here in the function summarize. Like say you want to look at the mean and standard deviations of the counts of rented bikes within each season. Because all the standard deviations are fairly similar, we learned, we learned nothing. Those standard deviations are quite large relative to the counts of these bikes. Standard deviation is almost half the size of the mean. So at least in terms of spring here, this is quite a variable statistic. So be it. If we wanted to then, sort for the ease of reading the outputted data frame, we could sort by the mean number of rented bikes. dplyr calls that a range, and you can see that we arranged the data frame, the outputted data frame, by the mean number of rented bikes, the column we named, m underscore rented underscore bikes. The frustrating thing to me is that it shows up in ascending order when I'd probably be interested in descending order. So if you use the function desc wrapped around the variable you want to arrange by, you can see that it then sorts the outputted data frame in terms of the mean number of rented bikes in descending order. This is where we learn that fall seems to have the highest mean number of rented bikes. This was our tutorial on the library dplyr in R. I hope this write-up makes a little bit more sense to you now, such that we have tried our best to turn code into sentences such that you can read from left to right, top to bottom by acting on the data frame of interest with a set of verbs. The verbs we looked at were arrange, filter, group by, and summarize. And it was really down to this operation that allowed us to read this code from left to right.